big corporations, they have brand guidelines. And, and so why shouldn't an architectural practice have the same mm. in that respect with regard to their images? Business of Architecture UK, episode 67. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am chatting with Keith Van Lowen, who is an architectural photographer and a lover of all things modernist and brutalist. And uh, Keith and I actually originally connected, I think it was, on LinkedIn. And I'd posted a video about Croydon flyover, where I was kind of going on about how beautiful I thought it was and how with a little bit of imagination and design flair that perhaps it could be used and reinvigorated as a fantastic public space and there could be things that could be housed underneath it and and I was basically marveling at the beauty of the kind of the formwork the concrete the the space underneath it the form of it and Keith Agreed. Creef was like, actually, I, I think it's quite an incredible structure as well. Actually, I've done a set of photographs of it. Have a look at these. And Keith sent me these breathtaking images of the Croydon flyover, um, which were really, really beautiful black and white images that were truly, truly stunning. And um, we connected over that. And I think Keith came to one of the Business of Architecture UK live events. Um, and then we kept the conversation going. And I met with him recently at the Tate Modern. And it became very clear to me that Keith was a, uh, a very different architectural photographer with a real genuine love of architecture. And he has an engineering background as, as well. So he's got a very kind of curious, inquisitive mind about the process and the way that architecture is formed and put together and he likes to celebrate those things and he's also had a lot of experience working in a wide array of different photographic um, print media publications so he has a very good under, uh, knowledge about how final images will look how they're going to look in print how they're going to look on websites and we got chatting and we thought it'd be a really great idea to record this conversation uh, looking at how to use or how important architectural photography is when building an architectural brand, when building your practice, when kind of creating your own identity and how best to use it and the sorts of things that you should be investigating with your photographer to make sure that you're getting the best out of them and also really understanding the mind of your prospective clients and how to create images that are going to titillate and excite and ultimately help you win more of the kind of work that you want to be winning. So really loved sitting down with uh, Keith. This was a fantastic conversation and I got to actually we got to do it in his house you all know that I love going and visiting um, fantastic spaces when I do these podcasts and this one was actually in Keith's south where was it south London southeast London home and he's got this incredible raw brutalist concrete wall that just runs down one side of the uh, the house it's an old sort of you know London stock terraced home and then it's got wax concrete floors and it keeps a bit of a um, carpenter himself and he's made these incredible you know shelving units and it's all beautifully decorated with wonderful interiors and you'll see a little bit if you're watching this on the YouTube channel you'll see you'll catch little glimpses of uh, of the actual space that we were sitting in but I was dead impressed and absolutely loved speaking with Keith so sit back relax and here's Keith Van Lowen. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself we can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of and I'd also love to hear more about your business and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020 so there's no charge or any obligation with this call just simply to find out how our content has been of value and if we get that far and with your permission of course what might be next what might 
be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Keith, okay. welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Ryan. Absolute pleasure to be sitting here in your beautiful Thank you. home <laughs> that I'd seen some pictures of that you showed me previously yep. and delighted to see that it was your home and it's, it is extraordinary. Thank you. It's a real, it's something that you should be really, really proud of. And Thank actually, you very much. and actually shows, you know, that you, you, you're, you're living your passion, if you know what I mean. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it's, uh, it's, um, it's my wife's dream as well. And, uh, you know, to, to live in a piece of architecture is a, is a real privilege. And, um, it's, it's almost as if, there's 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 not really so much as an ownership as I feel in a way that uh, you're you're kind of curating in a way in a way I know it sounds a bit odd but you know there's a space here and uh, we'll look after it and uh, add to it and um, go from there really and, uh, well, it, and well, really enjoy it. Well, it's it's interesting because it gives you a unique insight into. A, working with an architect. So mm. you're a photographer. Yeah. You specialise in architectural photography. Absolutely. You've got an incredible portfolio. You've got a background in engineering. That's right, yeah. So you have this multifaceted way of looking at architecture. Mm. Plus, you've gone through the process of building your own home or having your own yeah. home refurbishments, and you've got a real love for modernism. Mm. Uh, so it's a very interesting way yeah. of working with architects mm. and like being an advocate and a lover of architecture as well absolutely and, and and at the other end of it with with the architects clients i understand their pain as well of going through the build process i've lived it myself and been here during uh weeks of of the builders still still on 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 the premises um and uh so i I really do understand what it's what it's like to go through the build Mm. and um and and also the joys of that seeing it all come alive and uh and seeing the brief and more met really so what i want to talk to you today about is really what makes good architectural photography Mm. And this is a conversation that comes up again and again in the business of architecture and it's opened my eyes, particularly when I'm talking to publicists and PR and, you know, the the importance of having high quality images. Mm. And there are lots of different audiences for visual images as well. Absolutely. And there's a difference between, say, estate agency photography, Mm. architectural photography, and then also monographic architectural photography mm. which is for you know for other architects as yes, such. yes. So, so what is it that you that you do so essentially I work with uh, architects and interior designers and designers who uh, across a, a, a spectrum they might be doing residential or commercial property um, and um, in, in it, it's a kind of a crossover really in some respects they want to document their design um, and show the interesting elements of the build and um, and the uh, the space as a whole and to also nail down on some of the details some of the craft really that goes into it um, but beyond that and more importantly it's uh, really about showing a space in use as well and uh, effectively going from a building to a home or to a from an office into a, a space that you you want to work or create or be in a team with and it's that element that that I really want to be able to get to and draw out and uh, and it's in conversations with the architect or the designer that, that brings that out um, so in in building a brief Mm. that first conversation I would say 90% of the work is already done because the architects have had that conversation with their client so that the brief is in it's in play it's well and truly in play by the time I'm drawn into that conversation I've just got to look to see how I can 
bring that together in a set of images. In and, a way. and how do you do that? What's what's your process? And I, and I also want to uh, draw a bit on because I know you've you've had like a lot of editorial experience. Mm. So you, you know, you know, you were going through some various images, and we can talk about that later. About yeah. you know, just understanding the final, final platform. Images. Yeah. For an for an image. Absolutely. Um, things have changed greatly. I, I spent the first so I've been in business twenty years as a freelance photographer. The first ten. I spent um, doing editorial, primarily editorial and, uh, and advertorial, and, um, and where it was going directly into hard copy magazines, you learnt a huge amount throughout that experience, and most of the work I was doing there was portraits. Um, so you learn a great deal about what goes into the page what to avoid. For instance, if you do a double page spread, you don't want the person sitting in the middle, otherwise the staples are going to go right down their face. You want blank areas so that they can put in text. Now, of course, the magazines now, there's, there's less going into print and our uh, format has changed to the web. But still within that, it's still quite common for designers, for web designers and for producing content for the web and, and still back in magazines to put text over that and it looks good. Mm. So having those blank spaces of floors, the ceilings or sky is just as important and being aware of that at the time because this idea of, well, did you get a shot with after the event? I kind of hate that conversation. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. You know, it's either there or it's not. Yeah. You know, and, and maybe you can adjust it a little bit to get that in there. But, um, you know, it's, it's being aware of that, of that content, really, and, uh, and really being aware of the audience. So what advice would you give to architects then to help them get the most out of their photography and out of their photographer? Um, understanding their audience, who they're really uh, directing it. I think more more commonly, I, I look I look through a lot of architects' websites, and uh, and in some respects they can be over technical with the build process, um, which is great for me because I love looking at it because I'm interested in that. But uh, as a as an end client, that might be there could sometimes be a bit too much information there, too mm. much technical information, and um, what. What I think comes out in that first conversation between architect and client is a sense of what did they really want from the space. And maybe, you know, it's unlikely that they said, I want an extra 50 square meters, here's the budget and whatever. What they wanted was a better interaction with their outside space yeah. or a space to work instead of a box room. Um, and different emotions will come out of that. And I think by playing into that, that's kind of where the photography needs to go as well. Okay, so this is interesting. So part of your process would actually be revisiting or visiting and kind of immersing yourself in the architectural brief. Absolutely. And the client dialogue <clears throat> that's been yeah. happening and that you want to be able to communicate that yeah. because that's what essentially other clients, prospective clients are going to be interested in. Absolutely. That's I mean that's why we that's why we go to places, isn't it? That's why we go to visit one particular bar as opposed to another. It's this ability to see ourselves in that space and enjoy the atmosphere going on. Mm. It's not just a blank box, is it? So we want much more than it from the architecture than just the four walls, etc. We we want uh, we want atmosphere. We want uh, to empathise with what we see there. So, can you give an example of that? Of like where you've gone in and you've kind of told the narrative of the client relationship with the architect, or what the client was trying to achieve? Well, I think um, I think it could be done in several ways. One is one is the materials uh, used, but I think um, quite importantly is how the light plays with that. Mm. How the light comes in through the windows. Um, if I, if I go to site um, before the shoot, if I'm going to do a recce, I'm going to be looking at where the light falls 
on the front of the building when it's going to look its best, take a few readings as far as where the sun is, uh, best time of day to do that. You can't, you, you, you certainly are weather dependent. Yeah. You, know, you, you try and check the weather and try and get a good window when it's going to happen. But these are, in many aspects, the, um, the happy accidents that, that occur that um, it pulls in a, a different shadow or it, I, th- I think in, in many respects, um, we all know this about our own living environment. There, there is a place in your own home where you can sit or stand and it just all lines up. You know, you just get that view through there or you just get that angle through there and you just can't quite see around the mm. corner and there's a little spot of light there. But that's what I want it to, to invoke. I want to get that connection in there. And rather than just show this wall is adjacent to that one and there's a there's there's those, steel it's there. It's those kind of personal moments, like yeah. you know, ex- experiential moments. Absolutely. The yeah. I, I, I was reading um, one this morning and, and, uh, and an architect had created a, a yoga space for, for a residential client. It was in their, their garden. And right the way down the bottom, buried at the bottom, was this line from the yoga teacher about how the building made her feel on the first lesson which she gave in this space. Mm. And that, that is gold. That should be right the way at the top. And, and to, to try and capture that in some way... Mm. You know, maybe that needs really long shadows in there. Maybe you need to uh, wait right to the end of the day and to to get that sense of drama and to see the way the shadows play with the wood inside and and to to try and capture that that is really what's going on. Mm. It's it's more than just the architecture itself. It's interesting. I was chatting to Bowerbird as you know, um, yes. a few, a few yeah. months back, yeah. and I think it was Nick, who was uh, an architectural photographer mm. himself, was saying that in general, architects do not spend enough on their architectural photography. Mm. So why do you think that is the case? And what is the difference between, you know, if I was to use a student and give them a couple of hundred quid versus a seasoned photographer mm. and obviously this is a kind of this is a question where you know I know what that's like from a client perspective when a, mm. when a client is like well I'm going to go and use this builder and they're charging half as much as what you are as an architect yeah. and I presume it's a similar sort of absolutely but what, what, could you elaborate <clears throat> more on what what that what that difference is um well from a technical point of view there's there's a a certain kit that I would go in with, a tilt-shift lens. Uh, I think with, with most other photography, and certainly with when I was doing 10 years of portraiture, we all love a kind of a, a quirky angle or something like that. Mm. Um, whereas walls have to stand up, you know, <laughs> and you, you, you know, you don't want to look odd into a space. So we do want walls to be vertical. Um, so I think there is a certain amount of kit to go on with that. Um, as you said, my engineering background, I bring that into the frame as well. And I do understand how things go together. And I am genuinely interested in the build process. Mm-hmm. So from that point of view, we're going to be pretty much on the same um, song sheet when it comes to understanding what's going on. And the things that you want me to photograph, I'm kind of spotting them anyway yeah so we understand that um if you just asked a student to go in chances are they may not have a tilt shift lens so the problem with there is is the sides of the frame are then going to bow in yeah and yes you could talk that sort of out in photoshop to a degree you know, I've, I've, I've made this that. mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you generally try to crop in out the walls or something like that, and then you just get floor and ceiling. Yeah. Um, getting too close to an object as well, especially with a wide angle, and the same happens with with portraits as well. Is that as soon as you get too close to things, it all spreads out, um, 
and the things which are very, very close become huge. Mm. And uh, that's a problem. So we've got these we basket lights above our heads. We don't want that filling a huge amount of the frame. And a lot of the time, because, because we're working digitally now, we keep shooting away. And um, it's, it's and so interesting you're, you're saying that actually about the, the the kind of focusing on an object which isn't important because I've seen this before yeah. and I've used good photographers but they're not architectural photographers mm. and I've gotten back a load of images and you're like there's something not right about yeah. these there's something missing mm. yeah I mean huge lamp huge lamp yes yeah, <laughs> like, that's there. not what's important what, yeah why is why is that piece so dominant in the frame mm. and um, and and often I am moving things around just to get myself a better position to avoid these huge items which well they're not massive yeah i'm just too close to them and you can't get back far enough mm. um so it's i think it's really an understanding of that te- and it's taken me a while mm. to get that skill really and to to really understand um to think back over the post-production after the event and thinking that's a bit big. Yeah. And stepping away from things. I remember you, when we were talking, um, when we met first time at Tate, mm. and you were saying about how you often go in and bring your own uh, items, yeah. like like plates and yeah. cutlery and things like that. I mean, that's another level of, you know, often I've, you know, when I've done photographs in the past and you end up having like, you know, children's mm. children's toys are the things that mm. really irritate me yeah. the most but you're like <laughs> okay i get they're nice but yeah, yeah that's another level of yeah i mean to, to style a place it takes time and and of course there are professional stylers and i i would applaud that i think any any architect who wants to go and have that um that service i would certainly say bring it on you mm. know and it's um it means that i can work on other things besides jumping into shop, moving bowls of fruit around. And it, it also means that I haven't personally got to start bringing that all in. But I'm quite happy to take items from my own home here or go and purchase them and, uh, and take them in. If, I, if, I've, if there's a particular piece of joinery in a drawer, for instance, that requires cutlery, I would rather go and buy it than have tea stains and scratched cutlery in there. And, go and return it afterwards <laughs> and um it, it makes a difference you you can just see in the final image that, mm. it, that it just sometimes you don't even clock what it is but you just uh, you just know that it looks just right yeah and uh, I, i'm not I, I don't want to sort of remove the over human element but um you know, I don't really want to see spoons in the drawer with, with tea stains on them, that kind of thing, really. What are your thoughts about having people in, in your pictures? And this is often like architects like to have their photographs clear of Absolutely. human activity. Yeah. Or it's a um, idealised human activity. I think it depends on the, on the space, really. Uh, so technically, um, because I'm generally doing a lot of my shots with a lot of depth of field... Uh, the exposures are slightly longer, which does mean that if people are in the shot, there is a bit of blur. So for one point, um, right, I see. Okay, it, it does mean that if you knew that person, you could recognise them. However, they wouldn't be necessarily identifiable. Um, with commercial spaces, I think it's brilliant. You 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 need that energy. Mm. Um, if it's a, a commercial office or a breakout area, that kind of thing, you need to show first of all a sense of scale, um, the place being used, um, a, a a public space or a, an office space is going to look pretty dead without its inhabitants and seeing people actually using it. Yeah. Um, whereas uh, I th- I think. Residential places, I think, one way or the other. If 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 you you need somebody sort of you know going through it, um, then then do it. Really, I think that sort of is a is a brief decision that that you make um, at the time, really. And so, what would you say is the difference between the architectural photography that you do and say using a real estate agent photographer? Hmm. And then the kind of architectural photography that's for like a monograph or something. Um, 
I, I would say the idea of uh, the, the estate agent photographer, first of all, he may have a list of properties to go to in any given day. Yeah. So it really is get around, get in and get out as quickly as you can. Yeah. Um, quite often, uh, the objective is, is to show how large a space is and, um, and that does involve sometimes moving things to the side to try and get back as far as you can and just get as much as you can to fill the frame. Mm. Um, and there are key points that they will want to show. Um, might be wooden floors or things like that, but or a, or a, um, a particular feature, period feature or things like that. But they, they want to give a, the idea that you want to possibly move in or view that one. Right. Um, and do that as quickly as possible. Yeah. And, and some of them, though, they are, uh, you know, it's 15 or 20 images and, you're, and it's a one-bedroom flat kind of thing. <laughs> you know, you're going through them the whole time. Um, so trying to sort of give that as succinct as possible, I think, is what I'm trying to do mm. not try not trying to photograph necessarily every room it doesn't need all of that mm. um the monograph is more of a document in that sense really trying to show more of a, a statement piece yeah and i think i and I, I want to try and get across um a space that is used really whether people are in it or not mm. In the, in the frame, I want the element that it's it's for living in or working in or use. It's That's it's it's interesting because there's two very well three in those those types of those three examples. There's very different contexts with which the photography is operating, mm. and you know real estate agent photography is there for quick purchase or for consumption mm. in terms of like it's to get you into go and have a, yeah. a, a viewing of it. So it doesn't need to. It's a very different narrative to mm. say the you know what architects should be using in terms of on their websites or what they mm. should be going to publication with mm. because it's a very different it's a different marketing strategy and and it's a different audience yeah a totally different audience mm. yeah yeah I mean um, people looking at uh, at a, an estate agent um, platform if anything they're going to be more surprised when they get in there and say, oh, I didn't expect to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where is it? Kind of yeah. thing, you know, and um, is, is this it? Well, or, they're, no, they're notoriously deceptive. Than, absolutely. Yeah, it, it is that. Uh, but then they have a short uh, time frame to really get people hooked. The, the, uh, the building itself or the photos in it um, you're you're not necessarily buying that, are you? You're you're buying the location. You might be being you you might be buying where the school is. You might be buying where the station is. You're buying a whole raft of different things, and of course the price. Yeah. But the but when you look at the the space as a whole, you're only really seeing the decor on any given day. Yeah. And you're not buying that. Although I know that some people do buy show homes, so they, they do want to effectively turn up with a with a suitcase and move in. Yeah. Um, but I, I've in, in properties that I've bought, I've never I've never considered. I've, I've always tried to look beyond what I see on the walls. Mm. And some of it's been pretty awful. This <laughs> kind of thing. So I, I want to see. You know, I, I bought a place because it had two skylights once, and, and <laughs> that's why I loved it. So the the audience for the kind of photography that architects are typically speaking to, potential clients, mm. they are looking for being able to visualize themselves, not necessarily in that space, but they want to have a a connection to it, or they want to they want to have a feel like an at, the atmosphere, or they want to be able to see this is you know this is what this is what we want in our own home. Mm. I, I would really hope to think so, and um, 
And I think that that comes also down to why did the client choose that particular architect? They, they got along with them. They, they felt as if that they were the right fit. Mm. They could work with that person and um, that they got their understanding. And as I said, I, I don't think the brief was ever, I need a, I need a room in the loft. I think um, I, w- I would like to think that the architects are thinking okay, a bit deeper than that. You know, yeah. come on, you know, there's there's something more to it than that. What do you really want? And and it, it's probably well, we want to have a bigger family, and we want to move the master bedroom up there, and this will give us this, and this will give us a different layout downstairs. We'll be able to move things around. And before you know it, they're actually talking about they've got a, a different connection to their garden or they have a different, um, the, the box room is now uh, a proper office and it will give them a space where they can bring clients or it gives them a whole different remit. Mm. And, um, and I think it's that kind of conversation and that, that, that understanding gives the client the connection with the the architect, and hence why they, they get the job. Mm. Um, and I think it's drawing that out, really, that, uh, that's so, the important element. So what, so your, let's walk us through a little bit about your, your process then. So when you get approached by an architectural mm. client, do you often get approached by the architects or by the clients of the houses? Uh, generally the architect, yeah. Um, and the first thing you do when you have that, start um, that conversation? Yeah, well, I want to know the backstory, really. Yeah. Um, and uh, I want to tell them my backstory as well. You know, I, I want to tell them that I bring an engineering suitcase along to it as well. I think that builds my connection with them. Um, but yeah, I want to hear that story um, because that that loads my images in a way. I want to be able to draw that out. I want to know that before. It's kind of it's kind of useless after the event. <laughs> Isn't it really? So what, so what are the types of things that architects can do and the clients can do in order to make, you know, get the best out of the space when a photo shoot is about to happen? Because I, you know, again, this is something I've, you know, I've turned up to photo shoots before and the house is a mess and it's yeah. just basic things like, like that. Or then you get the photos back and there's like, you know, there's that child's rattle, which mm. is in all the pictures that you didn't yeah. see. And yeah, well, um, so I come from a standpoint where when I first um, started professionally, I was working on film. And because you're working on film, whatever you take that's within certain parameters, that's kind of what you get. Um, you're pulling Polaroid and you're looking at that. There's no back of the screen or anything like that. It, it, was, a, it was a short amount of time, a few years, before I went over to digital. Mm. Um, and I perceived it as good enough. Um, but I do work on the idea of if something is out of place, I'm going to jump into shot and move it and set it right, rather than just rely on post-production to put that right. So to answer the question there, a good clean-up before, even if... You know, we have to pay for that. Get the windows cleaned. Yeah. You know? um, let's uh, let, let's do a recce and say, okay, you know, we we want to be able to pare all this down. So can we put away all the fridge magnets and all the pictures of your family there because they might be very personal to people and they may not be what they they may want an element of privacy with that. Yeah. So we might want to sort of, you know, put that down. Well, that could take a couple of hours to to do. Mm. So if the client can sort of think about that beforehand and we can have that conversation first, that, that's really helpful. So to be able to go in and kind of unload the gear and um, decide where I'm going to do my first shot and then put things in to place and take things out, it just speeds up the whole whole process and once we've got the first shot kind of in the bag we can move on from there and it it becomes a little bit easier Mm. it makes it then easier also to be able to do the space from a different angle if we know that um you know it's relatively clean clean looking and and is it worth using architectural photography say 
for a project, I mean, this is, this is an interesting one, like projects that perhaps, you know, the architect might think this is not portfolio worthy. And actually, we don't know the power of architectural photography for actually really showing off a project that we thought maybe wasn't, mm. you know, wasn't magazine worthy. But actually, the investment of photography can actually bring out a new story and actually show it off in a very new light. Well, absolutely. Um, I think I think the um, the platforms for which people the, the, sorry, I'm going to rephrase that. Um, the platforms out there that have our attention are much broader than a website. I mean, a website is really kind of a just a just a page over there, really. Mm. But what really has our attention are things like Facebook and Instagram. Yeah. And so those projects, which we might think, well, I'll just spin around with my camera, they might have some real gold in there. And and certainly when I post on Instagram, I'm not just posting those great big hero wide angle shots. It's I'm posting uh, details, I'm posting something about my travels maybe, yeah. something along the way, something along the journey. And I think within some of those smaller projects, um, it's not, it's not really, it's all valuable. It's all a valuable. And of course, it's all um, something which you can have in the archive to show prospective clients in the future. Yeah. So there, there, there should be some value in some of it. Mm. And, um, and you know, invest in the in the photography. Really, it's it's an important part of your your marketing plan, mm. and um, we should really document that and and, and get it in there. And it, and it's really interesting actually. But it, to start, you know, when we're setting our fees, um, and we're then we're doing projects, is that you know we've got the we've got an idea of having a marketing budget mm. and a photography budget set aside rather than it's kind of been reactive because it does make such a huge of course difference and i think this is the thing like when we actually look at you know if, if people are listening to this on youtube i'll, I'll put some images up so we can actually mm. see some of your your work mm. um particularly of like of, of this space and of just how great photography can really make mm. a space you know communicate it very powerfully mm. visually um and it's just such a seductive marketing tool absolutely I, well well there are other elements within that as well um one of the main things as well for the interaction with the photographer is consistency so you do want you want that to be across your projects as well so if you've got three or six major projects on your on your recent work you do want there to be a consistent style as well mm. and so that's an investment in that process well, really well that's really interesting because I've never thought about that before mm. um, and it makes sense mm. and I can think of you know projects where you might have one photographer doing one thing over here and then yeah. it looks like something else over there yeah and it just sort of becomes jarring or you've gone and yeah. you know I've tried to take my own pictures and then yeah. you're trying to mash it all together and you get this kind of collaged effect exactly and if you develop if you develop a relationship with a, with a photographer over time, yeah. they're also going to start to pull out common themes and yeah. threads and visual narratives mm. and your little... So that becomes part of your brand. Absolutely. And, and it will show. It, it will show that um, over the course of those six, six projects, as an example, you'll see that the same type of images are coming up. There, there will be some great hero shots. There might be a nighttime shot. There'll be the details. There'll be the elements that sort of bring it all together. And, um, and then you'll click onto the next project or you'll scroll onto the next one. And it's following a the theme. And that's what, I mean, we, we see that all the time in everything that we, that we watch. Mm. There, there is this kind of formulaic look so to jump from one photographer, you might have to. It could be the other side of the world. Yeah. And you may have to use, because of cost, you may have to use another photographer. But if you can draw that photographer to say, this is what, this is the structure, then that can get potentially followed through. Yeah. Uh, and, and, I, and I think that's an important point. You've, you've got your... 
as you as you, you use the word brand, you've got that to run through, and you need to kind of stick to you know big big corporations. They have brand guidelines, and and so why shouldn't an architectural practice have the same mm. in that respect with regard to their images? Yeah, no, totally. I think that's a very important thing to start thinking about, and all for all of us to be to be building is that that practice narrative the practice mm. brand and the pa- practice mission mm. and that developing a kind of distinctive photographic style, style yeah. that kind of communicates your work mm. and I've known this from you know from large practices there's you know from working at RHHP or, or someone like Peter Barber for example it's generally using the consistent photographer mm. to tell the story yeah. for long periods of time yeah and, and you as architects when you go into your client you're having you're asking roughly the same kind of questions. Mm. So your brand is imprinted in that conversation with them. So then the conversation that you would have, say with me as a photographer, would be structured in some remit. Yeah. And from that we produce the pictures. And and I, I can't I can't shoot like not have candor because I'm not him. Yeah, <laughs> it's that kind of thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. I might be able to try and wing it to look to do a picture like that, but you know, I can't pour myself into into that other person much the same as what you you can't in that way. So, you know, you're you're putting your your stamp into that, and uh, and that's got to come out in the set of images f- through me. So, two so. two questions. Um, can you just walk us through, you were talking about the hero shots and the mm. sort of the wide angle shots, can you just mm. talk us through some of the, the kind of visual lexicon that we should always be looking to achieve in, um, our, in a photo shoot? What, well, are the, I, what are the sort of key images that make a good shoot? Well, I, I, I think, yes, we need some sort of, some key interior shots, maybe some, um, if we... we We've done the building as a whole. We want some some key exterior ones. We want them well lit as well. So that may be very early in the morning. That might be last thing at night, depending on which way we're facing. Um, sometimes I do go back around during the shoot to see whether something's changed with the light, and um, invariably it has. Mm. So I want to be able to quickly grab the camera and get that. And I think those are the gems, really. Those are the things that, that really pull it together and there may be just small small touches of home really which are brought in which just also tie that together it might be shelving or something like that but again filled with those elements which are lived in and life and 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 bring that together because even though we are we do tend to sort of click and swipe through it very very quickly I think it's those ones that sort of you you know that something's going on. There's a story going on. Yeah, there. yeah something that's got the motive yeah. quality to it. Yeah, and that's and that's what your client, your potential client, yeah. wants to see. So yes, some concentration on materials, concentration on uh, details, and some some hero shots as well that show. The space as best as it can, really tidy, um, windows clean, which which um, you don't want to see me in the shot as well reflected. Yep. You know, I'm very, very careful about that. I don't want to see tripod leg, legs either, um, or my face sort of, <laughs> with the camera in front of it. You know, it's, um, it's those elements which are... Uh, and and again, that sort of draws back the the attention to detail, which I learnt when doing film, being unable to change those things. Right. So I want to get it right there. And what are the key elements in the relationship between you and your architect? Um, it it comes down to to story. I, I want to learn about them and about their their studio and and how it all got going, really, and um, what their influences are. Mm. I'm. If if any if the things that I do read, it's um, yeah, it's the bio, it's the story, mm. and and that's that's key to me as well. Uh, in between doing portraits and doing architecture, I spent a year travelling, and and that's that's uh, instilled in me that 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 journey 
and um, and I bring that along with it as well. Where did you go? You went um, oh, I just headed off Middle East, India, Nepal, um, Southeast Asia, um, Australia, New Zealand. Got to Easter Island, which was incredibly magical. Um, up through South America, Cuba, and home. Yeah. And, it was, and was this where you developed an interest in architecture? Or was that already had that already um, always been there? I think it's always been there, uh, but I think it was it was cemented during that that journey. Um, and when I got back, I met an art director who started to look through my work and suggested this change of direction, and it just seemed to all click into place. Mm. I had this background in electrical engineering and mechanics and um, and I always felt bad in some way if I was looking at structure and being a portrait photographer it didn't quite sit, sit right with me yeah so now I can you know look at buildings all I like and 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 how it works and be curious about how it works and uh, and want to go and photograph that as well and um, and with modernism uh, I, I just really love that pair back way. Um, I'm off to Berlin and Dessau in a few weeks to revisit the, the, um, the Bauhaus School, which, um, which is in its centenary this year. Mm. Um, and I've got my own project going on with modernism, which will be in an exhibition next year. Amazing. It's really, really what's, this, what's this project? Um, I'm looking at... Uh, at modernist buildings, um, particularly like uh, the interwar period, yeah, and uh, and you don't really have to travel far to see them. Um, and I'm trying to isolate what is it that that gives it its modernist feature in a way. Trying to photograph a section of it and then present that not as a architectural document but something a little bit more abstract really mm. and that's what I'm attempting to do it's taken me a while to sort of get this together to even think about the process really well, it, it's very reassuring to know that you know your passion hobbies or the thing mm. the project that you're engaging with outside of mm. you know uh, of your general remit of architectural photography include things like your own house yeah and also doing a project where you're photographing modernism you're trying to understand or communicate these different elements of the, mm. of the buildings as a, as a sort of context and a background. Yeah. How did you move from engineering into, into photography? What was the first? Um, so I was going to a, um, I was going to a local college and, uh, I took up a couple of courses. I was probably very early twenties. Yeah. And, uh, and I just had this defining moment. I, um, was in the dark room, the paper went into the developing tray and the image came up. And I, I said to my friend at that moment, I'm going to be a photographer. And it was as, as instant as that. The light bulb moment. Yeah, it really was, the red light bulb. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was absolutely hooked. I really was. And, and it combined everything, combined process, technical skill and creativity. It, yeah. it was all there, really. I just had to do make one leap which is difficult to do as a as a creative which is almost find your niche find what what it is you really mm. want to to express how you want to express the creativity and um i was hooked but it, it took me 10 years to go from that moment in the dark room to to becoming a professional photographer and and i needed that journey i guess yeah you know i i, I don't I never for one moment think to myself, I wish I had um, 10 years before. What were, the, what, were the, what were the defining moments on that discovery period? Um, wow. Uh, that's that's um, it's difficult to say, really. Uh, I, I think, um, think realising that I was in a job that wasn't really fulfilling me mm. and I could change that. Yeah, really. I was fortunate in the situation where I, I could financially make that change. Um, traveling has really helped. Um, I think as well, in the early career, um, doing editorial 
really makes you think on your feet. Um, someone turns up and you think you've got them from an hour and you've got them for 15 minutes. Mm. And you can either spend 10 minutes arguing over we haven't got enough time or you can get going and, and get a shot in the bag kind of thing, you know. And, um, and, and engineering has also brought that to me as well where I was sometimes sent to the other side of the world to fix something and there was no one else but me on the ground to, to make it happen and it had to be done and I think I've sort of it, it's it's really helped me form what I do these days sometimes you just have to sort of think your way out of a out of a problem by yourself yeah and what was the difference when you went from kind of doing a lot of portrait model or you sound like you were doing you were doing a lot more sort of generalized photography mm. and then there was a moment when you began to specialize mm. and you picked your niche what was mm. the what was the difference doing that for your business? Um, sorry, can you repeat that again? What was the what, defining what, moment? What was, what was the difference that it oh, made right. when you selected a niche? Yeah. Because this is an interesting thing. Obviously, a lot of architects we deal with, like, we you know, we don't want to specialise. We want to be able to do everything. There's everything. A, there's a joy in doing lots of different things. Yeah. But also, like, from a marketing and a business perspective, it's a bit, it makes things difficult. Um, Maybe it's different for photographers, but uh, certainly art buyers, editors, picture editors, if they looked at my portfolio and they saw architecture, interior spaces, portraits, food, whatever, the images may have been lovely, yeah. but they would have said, so what is it you do? Right. And that would have been, and then you would have walked out thinking that you you walked in the door thinking that you're going to have a great interaction, you're going to get some work from this client, yeah. and you walk out just deflated because they can't really see they're, they're a stranger after all, mm. and they can't really see what it is you do, mm. and and I think uh, and that comes down to style, doesn't it? Really, it it it, it does define you, and um, and so yeah, I had to make that that choice at that point to take not leave some portraits on my website, but to completely remove them and decide this is what I do and, uh, and, and invest in that. Yeah. Genuinely invest in that and, and do a deep dive into that. And, and I've really enjoyed it. And if somebody asks me, yes, I could still do a portrait. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm often asked, you know, uh, okay, we do want you to shoot for us, but could you just do a series of headshots of, of us for our website? Brilliant. Happily do that. You know? <laughs> Excellent. So if people want to get in touch, what's the best way for them to get in touch? If they want um, to? Through my website or through my Instagram. Uh, so it's Van Loewen Photography, V-A-N-L-O-E-N, photography.com. Um, and my Instagram is Van Loewen Photo. Brilliant. Yep. Keith, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ryan. Really enjoyed talking really to you. Really great Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.